Well, happy Easter. He has risen. He has risen indeed, and I welcome everyone here at that church, and also those who watch us uh, faithfully by video, or those who just stumble upon us somewhere along the line. And uh, we welcome you to our Sunday service here at uh, Trinity Baptist Church in North Battleford, Saskatchewan, Canada. And uh, it's my privilege to open the Word of God to us this morning. And my name's Dan Millard. I'm the pastor here. And it's been my privilege to be their pastor here for, uh, I think this is my 16th year. So, uh, welcome. Welcome, everyone. On this Easter Sunday, um, I want to share a, a message that I've entitled The Presence of Hope. Now, at the end of this presentation, this message, this uh, sermon, whatever you want to call it, lecture, somebody says, so do you lecture every week, Pastor? <laughs> um, I, I, I'm going to, I don't normally do this, but I, I th- the Lord really impressed upon my heart this week that I need to present uh, not so much the church family that's here, but to those that are on watching us by video is the way of salvation. We've had a lot of uh, people that connect with us who I know, and, ha- and they have told me that they're searching. And they have not come to that place of acknowledging Jesus as their Savior. And, and I'm going to share with you uh, what I feel that that presentation should be. Um, you'll learn through my mis- ministry and messages that I'm not a hellfire brimstone, uh, turn or burn uh, pastor. I like people to understand what it is. You know, Jesus is their personal savior. I'd, I'd like to, to understand what it is that they are committing to when they ask Jesus into their life. It's not just simply just uh, touch my Bible and you are saved kind of conversation. I want you to think about it. I want you to pray about it. And that goes back to how I came to the Lord. And when I came to the Lord, uh, I was a messed up kid. And the gentleman that led me to the Lord wanted me, first of all, to get my life figured out, at least to understand that it's not a good luck charm, but that it's a lifestyle change. It's a, it's a, it's a new life that I am committing to. And if I'm willing to count the cost of that life. And so this church doesn't do altar calls. Uh, some people, some churches have altar calls every week. Some of my Colleagues in ministry do an altar call every week where they call the deacons forward and they have a a little uh, song that they play and they ask people to come forward to receive Jesus as a personal Savior. We don't do that as a church. Uh, I want you to process it. I want you to understand it. I want you to know what it means to be a born-again evangelical follower of Jesus. And so on this Easter Sunday, I want to talk about the presence of hope that we have in Christ. Uh, Luke chapter 23, verses 39 to 43, in the New King James says, Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, blasphemed the Lord. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuke him, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let's open in prayer, shall we? And we're going to look at Luke chapter 23, verses 39 to 43. Because you see, in the presence of hope, we come to realize that, first of all, the Lord has come to meet us where we are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning I'm a dead serious There are people watching us by way of video this morning that don't know you as your personal Savior, and I'm here today, Lord, as your mouthpiece, as your spokesman, asking that they would consider reaching out 
in becoming a born-again believer in Jesus. Father, I do pray that you would take this message of hope, take this message of Easter, that for so many years and so many people have come to understand it, but it's come to the point sometimes where they forget, <coughs> excuse me, the real essence of why we have Easter and what's it all about. And they get caught up in the pageantry. They get caught up in the, the, the emotion of the moment, but they don't see the need of knowing you as their Savior because they only go to church maybe at Easter, at Christmas, and maybe Thanksgiving if the family pushes hard enough. But Lord, this is a conversation that you have pressed upon my heart for individuals, for individuals personally that are watching us by way of video who are also in my heart as needing to know you and to needing to know you stronger and needing to know you in a way that brings honor and glory to you, Lord. And so, Father, as we look at this message today, we do pray that you would help us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, we see the Lord has come to meet us where we are. In Luke 23, verses 39 to 43, we have here the account of Christ on the cross. Here's individuals who had differing opinions of what the Lord should do. And with the Lord, he comes and meets us where we are. Have you ever wondered, of all the crosses on all the hills, in all the days in any month of, the year, of any year, why was it that cross? Why was it that hill? Why was it that month on that day and at that time? I suggest to you that it was not by accident that those men were in that place in the presence of Jesus. It was not by accident that Jesus was crucified in the middle of those two men. It was a divine plan of the Lord all along. You see, the Lord orchestrated the meeting of Jesus with these two men. We see it in Matthew 15, when he says in verses 25 to 28, now it was the third hour and they crucified him and the inscription on the acquisition acqui Accusation, accusation was written above the king of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and on the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Isaiah 53, verse 12. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's from Isaiah. That's from the Old Testament. That was written eons upon eons upon eons upon eons before Christ's crucifixion. Even back then, they knew that this was what had to happen. Perhaps this is one of the first times when we look at the men on the cross that they had an opportunity to experience the presence of God in their life. But when they needed him most, there he was, right in the midst of them, reaching out to them. One thief dying on the cross took advantage of God's closeness when he says, will you remember me when I come into your kingdom? And the other one says, hey, why don't you just save us and get us off these crosses so we can go on with life? One got it, one didn't. There are people watching by way of video today that get it and others that don't. Those who don't, stick with me. Because we're going to show you how it is 
that we can stand here today and say that we know Jesus as her personal Savior. Acts 17, verses 26 to 28 says, And he was made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times in the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of our own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Isaiah chapter 46, the first part of that verse says, I bring my righteousness near, it shall not be far off. Isaiah 51 verse 5, the first part of that verse says, My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, and my arms will judge the peoples. You see, in the routine of life and in the crisis of your life, the Lord is near you. He is your hope in the midst of all that happens in your life. The Lord places himself there so that you may experience his salvation, his comfort, his love, and his passion for you. Thus, in the presence of hope, we, realize, we come to realize that the Lord has come to meet us where we are. In this case, he's on the cross with two others. Secondly, in the presence of hope, we find that the Lord accepts us as just as we are. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. You see, the thief hanging on the cross was still a thief when he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into the kingdom. But he was no longer a thief when Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. You see, there is a transformation that takes place in the presence of the Lord. And what has been is not what always has to be. You see, the despair and helplessness melts away in the presence of hope. The problems that confront our lives become possibilities. The fear that sometimes comes and grips us melts into courage in the presence of the Lord. And the, fifth, the filth of the sin is washed away in the hope found in the presence of Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covenants, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortionists will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I say that because I believe that there's no error or omission in the Word of God. This is my personal opinion, because I believe that this is correct. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, I know right now you're going, oh, there he is, there's that church, they're picking on these people, they're picking on these people groups. See, showed you. Well, if you don't believe this, then of course you're going to say that. And so you have your opinion, and I have my opinion. And as the pastor of this church, we affirm that the Word of God is truth. That there's no error in the mission in this word. And thus, in our opinion, you will not inherit the kingdom of God if you continue to go down the path of sin. You see, in the presence of hope, we come to understand. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, is a new creation... Old things have passed away. You got a drinking problem today? You can accept Jesus as your personal Savior, but unless you get help, it's not going anywhere. But you want to know something? The Lord will give you the strength to not live in the old self anymore. Old things are passed away. You're in the occult. You're into all this weird stuff. 
and you don't know how to get out of it, you ask Jesus into your life and you get help and you move on from this. You don't stay there. You move forward. You move forward, not staying there. And I say that with all the passion in the world because if you have a drug addiction issue, just accepting Jesus as your personal Savior, all of a sudden, oh, wow, I'm fixed. No, you're not. You just happen to have a day off from shooting up or snorting or whatever it is that you're doing. You need to get help. You ask Jesus to come into your life. He forgives you of that sin and you move forward by getting help. And moving away from that. Getting away from your old life. And living a new life in Christ. You see, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. In other words, all those things that are going on in your life right now, when you ask Jesus into your life, and you turn from your old way of life, you now have a new creation. Because everything now becomes new. You see, in the presence of hope, we come to understand that the Lord will save anyone who will call upon Him. Two thieves hung upon the cross beside Jesus. One thief asked Jesus to remember him, and he was saved. The other thief, although he knew who Jesus was, never asked him for salvation, and because of his decision, he is right now today not where the other one is. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Well, I've got some questions for you. What about the routines of our lives? How many of us live in daily torment, living as though we have no hope? All we have to do is call upon Jesus and thus be delivered. That's what we got to do. You see, salvation is not something that the believer will get. It is something the believer possesses. Even in the midst of life, the Lord desires is to save you to give you reason for hope, to help you to know that He is not only your hope for tomorrow, He is also your hope for right now. Hebrews 4, 15 to 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. What weaknesses? Maybe you got a bad temper. Uh, maybe you've got a problem with the bottle. Maybe you have drug addiction issues. Maybe you've got stuck in some kind of weird cultish thing that is just confusing the brains out of you and you don't know what's going on. He knows. He understands. And you want to know something? He's a guy that can say, hey, I've been tempted. If you read the Bible, you'll see how Jesus was tempted in so many different ways, yet without sin. So when you think that nobody can understand your issues and what's going on in your life and that nobody gets it, nobody that the Lord knows, he goes, tell me something they don't already know. I'm here to help you, sir. I'm not here to cause you any more grief. Hebrews 7, 25 says, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. You see, when you accept the Lord as your personal Savior, that's between you and God. You don't have to come to me to be a Christian. I don't sit in a little room with a little box and you open the door, Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. You go talk to the Lord about that. If you want to talk to me and get it off your, off your chest, that's great. That's wonderful. But you don't have to. This is between you and the Lord. It's not me. It's not this church that you're having to talk to the Lord about. In other words, you don't have to go to this church to become a Christian. <laughs> Some churches teach that. 
The only way that you're going to know if you're a Christian or not is by coming to our church. That's wrong. That's biblically wrong. And thus, I don't care where you are right now, you can receive Jesus as your personal Savior right where you are standing, sitting, listening, wherever it may be. We just need to call upon Him. You see, in conclusion, in the presence of hope, we come to realize that the Lord has come to meet us where we are, right where we are right now. In the presence of hope, we find that the Lord accepts us just as we are, warts and all. In the presence of hope, we come to understand that the Lord will save anyone who will call upon him. There is no sin that he will not accept you. Thus, the bottom line of my message today is that Easter is about the Lord so unconditionally loving you that he did everything within his power to reach out to you with the wonderful message of salvation. You stumbling upon this video today from Trinity Baptist Church in the community of North Battleport, Saskatchewan, Canada. You're watching. You didn't stumble upon this. The Lord sovereignly directed you for this moment and this time. You see, this is where I want to talk to you about the fact that God's plan of salvation. This is what I talked about earlier, and I said, I don't talk about this very often in church because uh, it's not my, uh, I'm not a name it and claim it guy. I'm not a hellfire brimstone evangelist. I'm a guy that wants people to seriously think about their life as it reflects the need of the Lord. The God's plan of salvation is this. First of all, the Bible says there is only one way to heaven. It says in John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me, not by any other means. Thus, this is between you and God. Good works cannot save you. What are good works? Well, I live a positive life. I, I ascribe to the, um, um, uh, to the secret, the book, The Secret. You know, I just live in everything's positive, and I look at everything in a positive way, and, uh, and, and everything is manifested to me because I'm just being a good person, and I'm not doing anything wrong, and I'm not doing this, and I'm not doing that. That's great, but that doesn't save you. For by grace you were saved through faith and not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, it says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. What do you need to do if it's not by good works? Well, I suggest to you that we need to trust Jesus Christ today. We need to admit that you're a sinner. That's it. No buts. You say, Lord, I'm not a good person. For whatever reason, I'm not a good person. That's it. Lord, I'm a sinner. And you want to know something? We're all sinners. When you get accept Jesus as your personal Savior like uh, this church family has, then they've admitted their sin before you, and it's by grace we are saved. For it says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. Romans 5.12 says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin and so death spread to all men because all sinned. 1 John 1.10, if you say that we have not sinned, we make the Lord a liar 
and His Word is not in us. Thus, we need to admit that we are sinners. We need to be willing to turn from sin. We have to repent of sin. You know, I, um, I get really uh, surprised when I hear of churches where they say, oh, we had an evangelistic rally and 700 people came to Christ at their rally. And I said, really? You must have the fastest growing church in that community. Uh, how was your attendance on Sunday? And they get quiet and they go, well, that's, what's that all about? He says, well, come on, come on. These people need to be willing to move forward in their, what they've asked Jesus into their life about. I remember when I came to Christ, the individual that led me to the Lord, his name was Don Philip. Uncle Don said to me, are you willing to turn from your old way of life and live a new life in Christ? And I said, what does that mean? That you no longer live here. That you're going to live over here. And you know what? Don is not a fundamentalist that told me I had to go wear a suit, carry a King James Bible, that I could not go to any other church but a certain kind of church. No, he just said, you just need to turn from your old way of life and live a new life in Christ. I'm here today because Jesus came into my life. And it was through the witness of a godly man and his wife and family that I wanted to be like Don. I want to have a beard like his. He had his beard. I wanted to have a dog like he had. He had a husky dog. I wanted to, be, I wanted to have everything that he did. And he says, it's not about what I have. It's about a relationship with Jesus. So are you willing to count the cost, Dan, of what that will look like? has nothing to do with clothes, nothing to do with haircuts, nothing to do with nothing. Not the Bible you have. It has to do with a relationship between you and God. And I accepted Jesus, and I, I changed. I physically changed. I spiritually changed inside. You see, we need to be willing to turn from sin. Get help for your addictions. Get help for your marriage. Get help for the things that are going on in your life that are causing you such tremendous pain. It's not just a matter of just accepting Jesus and everything's fixed. That's just the beginning. <laughs> That's just the beginning. Believe that Jesus Christ died for you, was buried and rose from the dead. In other words, you need to accept the fact that somebody did something for you and you need to believe that. He sacrificed his son so that we could have life, eternal life. That's why we have Easter, to remind us of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We need to, through prayer, invite Jesus into our life to become our personal Savior. It says in Romans 10.10, 10, For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, pastor, you made your point. What do I got to do? You know, you've got, you've got me. Well, here's what I suggest. This is just my personal suggestion of what to pray. We need to say, dear Lord, I am a sinner and need forgiveness. I believe that Jesus Christ shed his precious blood and died for my sins. I am willing to turn from sin. I now invite you, Lord, to come into my heart and life as my personal Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's just say it once more. Dear Lord, I'm a sinner and need forgiveness. I believe that Jesus Christ shed his precious blood and died for my sins. I am willing to turn from sin. I now invite you, Lord, to come into my heart and life as my personal Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to WhatsApp me, and you and I will talk about it. Okay? But that's how simple it is. That's between you and the Lord, not me. And if you seriously want to turn from your old way of life and live a new life in Christ, talk to me and we'll get you the help that you need. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17. The old things are passed away, it says, behold, new things have come. So if you prayed that prayer, you now live a new life in Christ, let's get you the help you need. Okay. Now, there's a whole bunch of people by video, and my church family is before me. If you have received Jesus as your Savior, this is a reminder to all of us. As a Christian, we should read our Bibles every day to get to know Christ better. I know it can become a task at times. And we get behind and we get overwhelmed. I just say, just keep reading. So what do you didn't make your... If you have a, a universal reading plan like I use and I miss a few days, I just, just keep plugging away at it. Keep plugging away at it. And why do we do that? Because 2 Timothy chapter 2.15 says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So we need to be reading our Bibles every day to get to know Christ better. We need to talk to the Lord in prayer every day. Do you have a time where you'd spend time in prayer? That's one of the things that I especially enjoy, especially because I journal my prayer requests. I have a, uh, a system in my phone that goes to my, um, it also goes on to my uh, laptop. It goes wherever. It's, it's called one day. No, I'm sorry, day one. Day one. And I put my prayer requests in there. And once a month, I get a reminder to review my journal for the month. And I go in and I say, wow, the Lord answered the prayer there. Wow, look at that. Oh, that didn't, get, that didn't happen. Oh, that didn't happen. But we need to talk to the Lord in prayer every day. Because in Matthew 21, verse 22, it says, In all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Be careful for nothing, but in everything and by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, it says in Philippians 4, 6. Another thing that you should be doing if you've received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior is that you should get baptized. Get rid of that old life altogether. And in our faith practice, we don't sprinkle babies, nor do we pour water over your head. We baptize by immersion. Old life, new life. Old life, new life. Thus, if you haven't been baptized and you are attending a local church, Talk to the pastor about it. You should be attending worship at a church, not just watching on TV. I mean, I think it's a wonderful, it's kind of cool here in the community I live in. Uh, depending on who you talk to, our community is anywhere from 15 to 18,000 people. Um, it never fails wherever I go now. Somebody say, I saw you on Facebook. I saw you on YouTube. And I go, oh, okay, yeah, thanks, yeah, that's good. And I say, you should come to church sometime. And uh, they never show. But well, you want to know something? You need to be in church. You need to be there. Because it's part of the mandate of a Christian believer that they worship, that they have fellowship with others 
and that they serve with other Christians in whatever way means that a church has. And you need to turn from your old way of living. So if you're telling me today that you're a born again believer in Jesus and you still got a drinking problem, you still got a gambling problem, you still got a drug problem, we need to talk because I don't think you get it. You need help for your addictions. Yes, you know the Lord, but you need help for your addictions. And thus we need to turn from an old way of living and if need be, seek help for your addictions and sinful past. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? May, uh, that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall not, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. That's not my words. That's Romans 6, verses 1 to 7 sharing with us and telling us that you need to get help for those issues. Matthew 28, verse 19 says, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Matthew, I'm sorry, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You see, if you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, as a Christian, you should be reading your Bible every day. You should be praying. You should be receiving baptism, worship, fellowship, serving others, turning from your old way of life, and also telling others about Christ. And he said unto them, Go therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. It says in Mark 16, verse 15. In Romans 1, 16, and with this I close, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So today on this Easter Sunday, March 31st, 2024, If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, I showed you what you need to do, in my opinion, and how to accept Christ. If you've done that, contact me. If you tell me that you are a born-again believer in Jesus, that you believe Jesus is your personal Savior, and has nothing to do with your doctrinal position, has nothing to do with your holy background or whatever it may be, but if you tell me that you know the Lord, then where are you at? You doing this? Is this part of your life? Are you reading your Bible every day? Are you in prayer? Are you worshiping in a local church? Are you fellowshipping with other believers? Have you been baptized? Have you turned from your old way of life, or do you still have the issues that you had pre-Christian faith? I trust you don't. But if you do, Contact me and we'll get you help. Because after all, as a born-again evangelical believer in Jesus, we need to tell others about Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message this morning. Father, there are those who are watching by way of video that I am sure uh, that this has been uh, uh, between the eyes, a between-the-eyes moment, either because they don't know the Lord like the one the one thief, or they know the Lord like the other thief did. And here's Jesus in the middle, and he's saying, I want both. I want you both to continue to go forward. And for the thief, 
who says, just help get us off this cross. It's all I need. Lord, he met his own. And then the other one who says, Lord, remember me. And he says, you'll be with me in paradise. You'll be there. So, Father, there are people watching by way of video this morning. They're on one side or the other. And I pray, Father, that you would speak to their hearts on this Easter Sunday. Church family knows all about Easter. Church family has been worshiping here for over 50 years in this location. And for over 50 years, we have celebrated Easter Sunday. And so, Father, today we celebrated Easter Sunday with some phenomenal music. And thank you, Lord, for that music. And, Father, thank you for the message of the cross because this message today is what it's all about. And so, Father, may you be with all of us here, both those that are attending in person and also those that watch us by way of video, that you, Father, would speak to our hearts in whatever way it may be. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you.